you to record. Great. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I will start by asking all of us to mute your, uh, please mute yourself uh, so that we will be able to hear everyone. Uh, so uh, as I started, good evening, uh, good morning to our transnational audience. I'm so pleased to uh, have you all with us uh, in another event organized by the Holocaust Studies Program at the Western Galilee College, this time on uh, revisiting the collaboration discussion, Jewish police and leadership during the Holocaust. In his recent book, The Implicit, uh, Im Implicated Subject, uh, Beyond Victims and Perpetrators, Michael Rothberg points to a new subject position that is neither a victim nor a perpetrator, but rather a participant in histories and social formations that generate the positions of victims and perpetrators. He focuses on Primo Levi's description of the gray zone when referring to concentration camps and argues that the Nazi regime was set up to make victims complicit in their own victimization and thus to blur the distinctions between victims and perpetrators. And I quote, to understand the gray zone is to understand that the process of victimization in the camps does not only produce victims who are clearly set against perpetrators, but in addition creates a whole set of characters marked by uh, shades or uh, degrees of complicity who are not uh, easy to place on either moral or jur juridical maps. And in breaking uh, with stereotypical uh, notions of the innocent victim, the gray zone troubles not only conventional morality, but also legal judgment and historical understanding." End of quote. And I hope that uh, this intellectual event will help us go deeper into the gray zone and to better uh, our understanding of this complicated subject position. Before introducing our chair for this evening, uh, I would like to remind you all uh, to keep your mics muted uh, we will have a panel with three amazing speakers. Each will have 15 minutes presentation. And thereafter, we will have a response by Professor Dan Michman. Of course, all of the speakers will be introduced by our chair. Um, at the end, we will have time for Q&A. So please write your questions uh, in the general chat or refer it to uh, Jan's uh, uh, private chat. Uh, and we will make sure to introduce your question when the time comes. So our panel will be chaired by Professor Katagina uh, uh, Person, an associate professor at the Jewish uh, Historical Institute in Wars Warsaw, uh, currently Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Munich, head of the pub uh, publishing project and editor of five volumes of documents from the Ringelblum Underground Archive of the Warsaw Ghetto. She has, has also published Warsaw Ghetto Police, the, uh, the Jewish Order Service during the Nazi occupation uh, just recently, and uh, Assimilated Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto 1940 to 1943, which was published in 2014. So without further ado, Professor Pearson, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? I'm very concerned and I'm really sorry for what happened, but I'm also very, very grateful and, and very happy to be here today um, and to chair this wonderful panel uh, of three wonderful young scholars who work on an extremely important topic uh, and that's a topic of choices, of choices which, which people faced and which people made during the Holocaust. And in this case, people who later joined what was initially known as the Jewish Order Service and what became very quickly known as the Jewish Police. And uh, we'll be talking about Jewish police and Jewish policemen and the situation in three very different settings in Vilna Ghetto, in Tarnów, uh, and in Hungarian countryside. And I'm certain since we all are here, most of us will agree that this is really a topic which um, even though for many, many years, right, almost 80 years, like, uh, like many other topics which were considered to be quote unquote difficult, 
and topics of difficult parts of, of the wartime experience have remained outside main, mainstream research, um, it's time that it finally becomes part of it, that we can uh, research it, that we can discuss it in academic settings like this one, uh, that we can uh, speak about it in an academic way, that we can write about it, and then we can publish it, and then they can reach a uh, wider audience. Uh, and it's important because we really need it. I think we really need it in order to fully understand the complexity of, of victims' experience of the Holocaust, the complexity of, of life during the Holocaust, and also in order to disperse all the myths and misconceptions and lies which arose around the, the Jewish order service, which even though outside academic research, nonetheless remained very much part of, uh, of popular discussion, of communal discussion uh, since the Second World War. So I think this panel will be a very, very important step on that way. And I'm, I'm really grateful to the organizers and, and to the participants for, for doing what they're doing. So um, without further ado as well, let's say, uh, we'll move to our first speaker uh, because that's why you're here. And uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Talia Farkash, who's a lecturer at Open University in Israel and also a postdoctoral fellow at bar University at the Institute for Holocaust Research. She'll be a Yad Vashem fellow next fall. Talia was a claims conference a uh, Saul Kagan fellow and published a very interesting article on uh, the forced labor camp in Demblin, Irena, uh, in Dapim recently. Her PhD dealt with, with Jews of Tarnov during the Holocaust and she'll be speaking today about, uh, about that topic. And the presentation is entitled Collaborators of Victims, the Jewish Police in Tarnov Ghetto. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Person. Just a minute, I'm going to share screen. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me uh, for this lecture. Although I will admit that when Daniela uh, asked me to participate in this esteemed international conference, I had my doubts uh, and I will explain why. Uh, several years ago, I participated in an international conference along with other Holocaust scholars. The majority of their fields of research were not the Jewish subject, and they also did not base their research on Jewish sources. I think that I was the only one there uh, to introduce the, the, uh, this aspect. I presented uh, heroin testimonies concerning the function of Jewish policemen in Tarnum in the course of the Holocaust. While the purpose of the lecture was to highlight the dilemmas that were faced by the Jewish policemen and the fact that they too were victims, several scholars left with the grave uh, conclusion that the Jewish policemen in town were collaborators with the Nazis. In the discussion that followed, some of them described the policemen using the word that is usually reserved for the murderers, uh, perpetrators. As far as I was concerned, I had failed. I thought, how could some people research, uh, come to the conclusion after my, uh, this conclusion after my lecture? It was obvious to me that anyone who could consider those people to be perpetrators perhaps did not understand the Holocaust as I did. A lot of time has passed since then, and my research into the Jewish police in Tarnov has developed. And along with it, with it, my insight regarding the tools we need to examine the Jewish leadership during the Holocaust in general and the Jewish police in particular. This insight might help to, uh, to uh, help uh, better explain the reaction of the Jewish public in general and the Jewish leadership bodies specific, uh, specifically as I understand them. So let us begin some background about Tarnow. The, Tarn, the town of Tarnow is located in the Southern Polish region of Western Galicia. Here you can see it, uh, 75 kilometers from the city of Krakow. On the eve of World War II, its Jewish population, 26,000 residents, accounted of half of, it, of its total population. And uh, testimonies that were given in the course of the war and afterwards contain harsh description of the Jewish policemen's conduct in Tarnow. 
the most common accusation that was made against most of the members of the Jewish police was that in the course of actions to round up Jews and take them to death camps, the Jewish police uncovered bunkers and sent the people who were hiding there to their death. So let us examine, do these testimonies tell the whole story? Can we at least add more aspects of the story? Were the actions of the Jewish policemen a result of having no choice? Were they themselves victims with no ability to choose? How much did they help when they had able to? And did they have any space of influence? During the period between October 1941, when the Jewish police started to operate, and the September 1943, when the entire Jewish community of Tarnut was totally annihilated, the Jewish police underwent a dramatic evolution in terms of the duties assigned to it and its relation with the Jewish population. These changes were all consequences of the changing reality and the intensified persecution of Tamil Jewish population under Nazi rule. I will focus on several dilemmas that the Jewish policemen faced uh, as uh, opposed to the accusation made against them. And I could speak, sorry, and sorry, and I could speak about this subject for much longer if time permitted. The first dilemma, removing Jews from bunkers to be killed in the course of in actions. Okay, here you can find the picture about the, from the first action. Okay, here. For example, during the second action that was carried out between September 10th and 12th, 1942, 8,000 Jews were deported to Belgium. This second deportation was a turning point in the relation between the Jewish police and the Jews of Tarnut, in Tarnut. Jewish policemen played an active part in uncovering hiding places and turning Jews over the Gestapo in certain deaths. When the second action began, many Jews were unable to obtain the life-saving stamp on their ID cards, and they went into hiding. The Germans realized that the number of Jews they had rounded up fell short of the required quota for deportation. Consequently, the Gestapo summoned the members of the Judenrat and the Jewish police, including their wives and children, and announced that if the number of Jews arriving at the same point did not increase, they, along with their families, would be deported with the rest of the ghetto population. Jewish policemen, at, time, at times under pressure from their families, began to expose hiding places one after the other. Such pressure clearly contributed to their betrayal of fellow Jews. In an extreme case, a Jewish policeman uncovered the hiding place of his own mother and turned her over the Gestapo. When trying to determine whether the Jewish policemen could have acted differently, one must consider the price they would have to pay, the risk of their own lives and those of their families. It is also important to know that there are many testimonies about policemen trying to save Jews during the second action. And now note in this context an interesting point. David Simit, or David Simit, was a Jewish policeman in town of Ghetto. He was accused of being an agent of the Gestapo, who could, who could cruelly beat women and men, and in least one case he beat Jew to death. CIMET went to Canada after the war and the organization of town of immigrants in Montreal began legal proceedings against him, which ended in an arbitration agreement. In the arbitration documents, you can see it in the case of the town of immigrants versus the bit CIMET, there are two completely contradictory testimonies regarding CIMET's conduct during the same event in the course of the third action. Look. Uh, here it says that he helped Jews from the bunker at number four Levovska Street hide, while in the second uh, testimony, he, uh, it is state, stated that the, he turned the people in the same bunker over the Germans. So the, 
that not only is it is wrong to accuse all policemen of betrayal, but even a single policeman action has different aspects. And there is a different testimony here that is not connected to the arbitration procedure, procedure which state that Simet did indeed save Jews from number four Revolsky Street in the course of the third action. The second dilemma is preventing escape from the ghetto. Uh, in the ghetto, as you see, the Jewish police's primary task was guarding the borders of the ghetto, which was surrounded by two meter high wood wall. The Jewish policemen were in charge of preventing Jews from slipping out uh, via the ghetto gates, its surrounding wall. People resented the Jewish policemen for not allow, allowing Jews to escape from the ghetto, but it should be remembered that the policemen were also in mortal danger. Thus, for example, when a Jewish woman attempting to flee was detained outside the ghetto, the Gestapo summoned all Jewish policemen and checked who was on guard duty when the woman left the ghetto. The two policemen found to have been on duty were shot on the spot. Dilemma, third dilemma, uh, preventing passage between ghettos. In the aftermath of the third deportation that took place on November 15, 1942, the ghetto was reduced in size and divided into two parts. Sec section A was for the non-working Jews, while this fit for work were placed in section B, placed in section B. In November 1942, the combined Jewish population in both sections numbered approximately 6,000. Movement between the two ghettos separated by the wood fence was strictly, strictly forbidden. The additional functions assigned to the Jewish police after November 1942 included in internal supervision and guarding the border between the two ghettos. Many families were torn apart and couldn't visit loved ones across the border. Crossing the border was an often punishable death. Many testimonies indicate that some policemen prevented any passage from the one ghetto to the other and brutally beat anyone attempting to cross. However, not all Jewish policemen behave in this way. Many testimonies recount how some Jewish policemen did allow Jews to move between the two ghettos or even to go outside the ghetto boundaries. It should be remembered that the Jewish policemen themselves were risking their own life, lives and would have been executed and had, had they been caught allowing such infractions. Thus, for example, Shmuel Springer, a policeman and a member of the Jewish underground in Tarnow, was shot by the Gestapo after he was caught allowing Jews to cross from one ghetto to the other. Indeed, in his post-war interrogation, policeman Zimmerman, uh, Max Zimmerman, said that some Gestapo men went undercover disguised as Orthodox Jews to test the Jewish policemen and they did not hesitate to shoot Jewish policemen who they thought did not obey their orders. Okay, the fourth dilemma, liquidation of the ghetto, removing children, when, during the liquidation of the ghetto, removing uh, children from the trains to Plashov. The Tower of Ghetto was liquidated on September 2nd, 1943 in an operation commanded by SS officer Emun Gott, commandant of the Plashov uh, concentration camp in Krakow. During the action, Tower of Jews were sent that very day to the train station and onward to Auschwitz. 2,000 of the Tower of working Jews were selected and the next day they were loaded on a train and taken to the plash of camp. Mothers on the train hid toddlers in their bags and suitcases, first dozen them with sleeping pills. Apparently, Emin Gott and his men became aware of the children's presence when some of them woke up and began crying. Consequently, God went from car to car, uh, from car, from one car to the next, and announced that if anyone 
was caught hiding small children, all the Jews in the train car would be shot. Apparently, policeman Zimmerman, Max Zimmerman, went into the cars and removed some 40 children. Shortly afterwards, the children were taken away uh, by God and uh, the Gestapo men and shot. In his trial, Jewish policeman Zimmerman admitted that he had indeed gone from car to car and ordered people to hand over the children. Otherwise, everyone in the car would have been put in death, to death. He claimed that he personally did not remove children from the train, but rather it was another Jewish policeman. Zimmerman further testified that in any case, the Jewish policeman in question was escorted by the Gestapo men who would not have allowed him to turn a blind eye at the presence of children in the car. Zimmerman claimed it was the Jews themselves aboard the train who forced anyone trying to smuggle children to hand them over the Gestapo. In fact, the truth of this claim is substantiated by other sources. Just a minute, I have a problem here with my computer. Okay, some two weeks after the final liquidation of the town of ghetto, most of the ghettos remaining Jews among them, all the Jewish policemen were sent to the Shebnia labor camp in the same district where most were murdered. Those who survived uh, uh, the, uh, bore the stain of the role for the rest of their life. And as we have seen, that stain continued to hunt Jewish communities around the world like Zimmerman, okay, uh, the Jewish policeman from Tarnow who was put on trial in post-war Poland on charges of collaborating with the German occupation authorities and persecuting a Jewish population and was sentenced to death. And Zimmet, uh, who emigrated to Canada after the war, some say that he was so deeply hated by the Jewish public that during the end of the days of the war, his wife and daughter were killed by Jews from town. We see that the reality, now I'm going to finish it. Uh, we have seen that the reality uh, was complex. As a result, uh, um, uh, evaluating their deeds as good or bad is impossible. There is a gap between a, a Appearance and reality, and the fact that there are, can be no generalization. Each case must examine independently. In addition, I suggest examining the deeds of the Jewish policemen in a broad context of trauma, in which these were regular human beings who were subjected to ongoing trauma that resulted in helplessness shock and mortal fear with no ability to persist the situation. How can we expect people who were forced into such an extreme situation to develop in real time a moral backbone, inner freedom of choice and to uh, discern between good and bad, right and wrong. Thank you so much. This is the end <laughs> of the lecture. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And now, uh, this was very interesting, both in terms of the history and the memory as well, I think, and how it all came into place. And now we have our second speaker, who is uh, Laszlo uh, Bernard Vespremi, who a graduate from um, First, Karol e. Gaspar Calvinist University of Budapest in history, and then in Holocaust and uh, genocide studies from the University of Amsterdam. He's currently a PhD student of intellectual history at uh, the Etwosh Lohnat University of Budapest and a deputy editor of the largest Hungarian Jewish news portal. And uh, the paper which we'll hear today is entitled Betrayers of the Fellow Victims. Hungarian Jewish policemen during the 1944 rural ghettoization. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. And I am very, very honored to be uh, speaking here uh, today. 
Uh, I have also prepared a, a very, very beautiful and fancy uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation, which has decided to stop working about 15 minutes uh, before I logged in here. Uh, but that is not going to stop me. So uh, I'm just going to uh, um, tell my lecture and I will hope that uh, I will be able to uh, uh, keep your attention. Um, now, as it has very correctly been stated, my uh, um, presentation is about the uh, Hungarian Jewish uh, uh, ghetto, policemen, Jewish police during the 1944 rural ghettoization and uh, deportation. Uh, the main questions which I'm going to be looking at are, uh, um, you know, who are the uh, Jewish uh, policemen who set up the uh, Jewish, Jewish uh, 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 polices? Um, where did they serve? What roles did they, did they fulfill? What roles did they have in the ghettoization and deportations? Um, what charges were leveled against Jewish policemen after the war? How did they see themselves? Um, one thing which has to be made clear is that this is a very under-researched subject. Only a few uh, papers or books on the Hungarian Holocaust have mentioned the fact that there was, there was a, a Jewish uh, uh, police at all during the 1944 deportations. Some local historical works uh, have gone into a little more research, but uh, you know we're talking about a few sentences and entire papers or books. So this is really uh, some new ground. Um, um, one, one interesting question is how, how was the, the Jewish ghetto police set up at all? You know, after the, the German occupation of Hungary uh, on 19th March, 1944, um, I think I can hear somebody's microphone not being muted. Yeah. Um, so uh, after the German occupation of Hungary, 19th March uh, 1944, um, there came a, a an, an order from the Prime Minister's office, uh, the the order number uh, 1020, uh, 1520, which which uh, had a, a rather cynical title. It was about the self governance of Jews, and this was what has essentially set up the Jewish councils in Hungary. And one sentence of this decree was that. Uh, these, these councils were, in a sense, uh, responsible for the behavior of people wearing the yellow star that is Hungarian Jews. And this sentence could have been interpreted as, as, uh, as you know, saying that uh, Jewish councils all over Hungary were responsible for the behavior of Jews and therefore they had to set up their uh, own polices. But as, we're, as I'm going to mention, uh, in fact, not all uh, uh, Jewish councils, not, not all ghettos set up their own Jewish police. Um, so essentially, what was the Jewish police in Hungary? They were uh, uh, legally not very supported, rather uh, ad hoc uh, organizations set up to control who was going in to the ghettos, who was going out of the ghettos. Um, they were called many names, local police, house police, assistant police, but the most uh, commonly used name was the, the, was the uh, Jewish uh, police. Now, uh, the Jewish police was sometimes set up by the Jewish council, sometimes by the Hungarian police, sometimes by the Hungarian rural police called the gendarmerie, or sometimes by the mayors. Um, but it was never entirely cl clear uh, what exactly they were. They often didn't know themselves. Sometimes the sources are very clear about, you know, Jewish police and Jewish councils asking, what exactly is this organization? What are they doing? Most members of, of these Jewish police were set up uh, that were set up were, were uh, made of either very old or very young people. That was because of the system of Hungarian uh, unarmed labor service. Most men of uh, military age were drafted into unarmed, uh, humiliating labor service on the Eastern Front. And therefore the Jewish police uh, had to be made of either very young or very old uh, people. Some of them had these armbands, white or yellow armbands. Some of them didn't, some of them had hats, others didn't. Some of them had uh, sticks or whistles. Others didn't, uh, but the sources are pretty clear that they all had to wear the yellow star. Now, we do not know too much about most of the Hung Hungarian uh, uh, Jewish police, but uh, we do know pretty much about the Jewish police in the eastern Hungarian city of Nyíregyháza. Um, there we know who was the, who was the uh, head of the uh, uh, local Jewish police and also who added the Jewish police in the large collection camp for Jews, which was set up outside of the city, uh, the name of the latter was uh, uh, Lajos Gondos, whose original family name was Gottlieb. And he's going to be important at the end of this presentation. So it's good to remember his name. Uh, we know pretty much uh, um, all, the, all the names of all the, all the persons who were in the, in the Jewish police of this city. So uh, I have some, some basic data about them. We know that their average age was uh, 30 which means that most people were very young in this, in this ghetto police. Uh, most of them had uh, intellectual jobs as their jobs. Only a few of them were uh, working class people. Um, 
uh, we also know that in other other cities, the the Hungarian police arrested uh, people, Jewish men, who they deemed dangerous. So obviously, because of this, uh, not a lot of uh, strong, able-bodied Jewish men could ju could join the Jewish police. Um, we know that uh, there were more than 200 ghettos. Some people are saying 300 ghettos in Hungary at this time. Only a few dozens of them had Jewish police. So uh, obviously this was not uh, in all of the ghettos. It's also interesting to see um, that, that the number of how many Jewish police there were in the ghetto, uh, it was not necessarily correlated uh, to the, to the uh, size of the city. In one of the biggest Hungarian cities in Debrecen, there were uh, only 25 ghetto policemen in the ghetto police. And in a smaller town like uh, Mate Salka in Eastern Hungary, there were uh, 200 ghetto policemen. So there was not necessarily a relation between how big the city was, how many people were serving in the ghetto police. Uh, the ghetto police were either, e either uh, uh, controlled uh, by uh, the Hungarian police or the Hungarian gendarmerie. Uh, and and um, uh, we, it, there, there was one, one uh, rural city uh, in northern Hungary where I have found that it was interesting that the Jewish policemen came, claimed after the war that they, they were even somehow part of the ordinary Hungarian police. Uh, this was said during the trial of one Hungarian policeman after the war. And the judge thought that this was very weird or interesting. So he asked back and said, are you sure that you were part of the Hungarian police? And this Jewish man said that, yes, I was. But this seems to be a very individual case. What exactly did the Jewish policemen do? They had very uh, different jobs in the different ghettos. Sometimes they uh, performed kind of health services, checking for the health of people. Uh, sometimes they did a kind of a an emissary service, they, they handed over messages, notes, uh, sometimes they uh, did uh, firefighting, sometimes they did, uh, in, in one ghetto, one particular ghetto, there was even, even a kind of a, kind of a shaving room set up for Hungarian police, ordinary police, where the Jewish policemen had to shave the Hungarian policemen. Um, if, if we look at what, what technically these people did, um, not much comes up regarding the ghettoization or deportation. This was largely performed by the ordinary Hungarian police and, and, and gendarmerie. So the Hungarian Jewish policemen were not needed for this. Um, it is also interesting to look at what privileges Hungarian Jewish ghetto policemen had. That doesn't seem to have to be have been too many privileges. Apparently, they didn't have too many privileges. One thing that one could mention was that sometimes they were responsible for distributing the uh, cigarettes or alcohol sent uh, into the ghetto by other people, people who wanted to help. Uh, this could have allowed for them to have some kind of advantage on the black market, uh, but that is basically it. Um, on the other hand, they had a lot of responsibility. If people escaped, they were often threatened with death. We know that in some ghettos, the Jewish policemen were tortured just as much as the, the other uh, Jewish people in the ghetto. For example, in the uh, ghetto of Munkac, which is in uh, the Ukraine today, back then it was in Hungary. We have memoir memoirs which, which uh, uh, explain how the Jewish policemen were forced to hold heavy stones and walk into the cold river where they had to stand with these stones uh, to amuse the Hungarian police and the Germans. Uh, on the other hand, we do have a lot of memoirs which are saying that um, uh, some get Jewish policemen, ghetto policemen, they tried to help the other Jews either by going out into the city and buying food, buying newspapers, or by developing their own kind of methods to warn Jews. Uh, in one ghetto, the, the memoirs are saying that uh, the, when, when the Hungarian police or the German uh, men, uh, soldiers were approaching, the Hungarian Jewish ghetto policemen started beating on the walls with their sticks. And then the Jews could hear this voice and they could know that the Hungarian police or the German are approaching. Um, in another ghetto, uh, there, was, there was this other system. Uh, normally, uh, the Jewish police would talk in, a, in an ordinary, pretty low voice. But when they saw Germans or Hungarian police approaching, they would start talking very loudly, almost yelling at each other. And through this, uh, Jews could know that, that uh, the enemy was approaching. It's an interesting question whether uh, one can talk about any Zionist presence among the ghetto police. Uh, Isaiah Trunk has said that in Poland, most, most uh, ghetto policemen were Zionists. I didn't find any sources about this in Hungary, but I did find one memoir in which uh, a person who has survived the Holocaust and later made Aliyah has written that uh, uh, the, the, the local Zionist movement was trying to send people into the Jewish police so that they would have positions within and they could help uh, other Jews. Um, 
there are only a very few sources which are saying that Hungarian Jewish policemen had to do anything with the deportations in some cities. I'm talking one or two cities in the many hundreds of Hungarian cities. Some memoirs are saying that they had some role in collecting people from their homes or they were cleaning the cars, uh, the train cars uh, between deportations. Um, but uh, by and large, the deportations in Hungary were, were per perpetrated by the Hungarian police, uh, the collaborators. So again, the Jewish policemen were, were simply not uh, needed for this. Uh, we do know that in one city, though, uh, Hungarian Jewish uh, policemen tried to um, smuggle food into the cars. They were caught. And because of this, they were de deported aside from their families, their, their wives and children as a kind of a punishment. Um, how exactly the Jewish policemen in Hungary sold themselves, not a lot of memoirs have been published, not a lot of interviews have been made. I was lucky enough to talk to one of the last surviving, probably the last surviving Hungarian Jewish ghetto policemen um, two years ago. We exchanged emails. Uh, we were planning to meet, but that didn't happen because of COVID. Uh, they they, they uh, didn't see their, their, their roles very much uh, alike to to what uh, the previous presentation has described. Uh, in fact, some of these people who survived the Holocaust had later read works about the Polish Jewish ghetto police. And they, they really emphasized that we were not like this. We were performing tiny tasks. We didn't have a role in the deportations. They were very, very uh, adamant in, in, in uh, uh, saying that the Hungarian Jewish ghetto police, Jewish police, that they, they were a little different. They were, they were um, not so important in the, in the um, events of the Holocaust. Um, it's also interesting to look at how exactly uh, uh, the post-war retribution looked at Hungarian Jewish ghetto policemen. I have managed to find two trials of Hungarian uh, Jewish policemen um, in front of these largely uh, left-wing uh, pro-communist or communist courts. Um, I, I do have to mention that the, the contemporary press, the post-war press, which was largely a uh, left-wing pro-communist press, has not treated the Hungarian Jewish ghetto policemen too well. They have uh, written very nasty articles about these people. They said that the Hungarian Jewish ghetto police were the uh, perpetrators, uh, no, sorry, the persecuted people persecuting other persecuted people. It sounds a little weird in Hungarian, also sounds weird in English. This was what they were writing. They also said that they were the betrayers of their fellow victims. This is where the title of my presentation comes from. Um, they didn't have a lot of understanding towards these people. So uh, I had two trials which I was looking at. One was this uh, aforementioned Lajos Gottlieb from the city of Nyiregyháza, and the other was a certain uh, Istvan Weyman, uh, who was uh, who was a Jewish police leader in a in a tiny local deportation camp in Western Hungary? Uh, I'm going to talk more about Gottlieb, so I'm just going to mention Weyman. He received five years in prison for his activities, uh, and then uh, um, he he uh, didn't accept this. You know, he he went for another trial, and then the the high court uh, decided to acquit him. Kind of the same story with Gottlieb. First, he received two years in prison, and then he was acquitted. So, if we look at the trial, uh, it's very clear that uh, he was he was discriminated because of his Jewish ancestry. Uh, the the uh, court uh, expected him to have performed more, to have resisted more because he was Jewish, and and everything that they brought up against him. Uh, you know, the the witnesses they like they they largely said that he had been slapping people and saying foul things to people during the deportations. Um, the, the, the sentence was very clear about saying that because of this, because he was Jewish, he was receiving a harsher sentence. And I'm going to quote this. Um, in the view of the court, the beatings which uh, Gottlieb has performed on, on, on the other uh, dep deported people, uh, because these people were of the same faith and, and nationality as him, these beatings were more painful, humiliating, and more torturing than those beatings received from the Hungarians or the Germans, end of quote. So this, this was the opinion of the court. Because he was Jewish, he had to receive a stronger sentence. Um, th this was, of course, not, not uh, the opinion of every court. Like I said, his case went to the high court, and then he was acquitted. So to sum it up, I would say that the Hungarian Jewish ghetto police, uh, Jewish police, we don't know too much about them. This, is ju this was just the tip of the iceberg, which I have just described. There's not a lot of sources. Uh, much more has probably been happening. There's just, 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 there's just not a lot of sources about it. Um, they were not necessarily uh, important to the, the ghettoization, the deportation. They were performing 
uh, smaller tasks. Uh, they were mostly not even able-bodied uh, uh, grown-up men. Many of them were very young kids. I'm talking 14, 15, 16-year-old boys. And uh, if we look at how the post-war press has treated them, how the post-war trials have treated these people, uh, there was definitely some anti-Semitic prejudice in these in these uh, articles or in these in these sentences passed by courts. Uh, they were treated more harshly because they were Jewish. Um, that is basically the, the end of my presentation. Um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. This was again very interesting and a completely different place and a very different story, yet quite similar post-war story. And I think it's something that we can maybe um, discuss later. But now we move to our last speaker today, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Daniela ozaski stern a lecturer in Holocaust studies at Western Valley College also a postdoctoral researcher for the Institute of Holocaust Research at bar Ilan University, a former postdoctorate fellow at Yad Vashem and a former ERI fellow at USHMM, and for over 10 years, a director of Morishet Holocaust Archive. Her PhD at the University of, uh, of Haifa dealt with Jewish partisans in Lithuania and West Belarus, and she recently published, again, a very interesting article about execution of Jewish partisans in the Lithuanian forest, which was published in the International Journal of Military History and Historiography. And the title of her presentation is uh, Ambivalent Attitudes of Vilna Ghetto Inmates Towards the Judenrat and the Jewish Police. Thank you so much. Uh, and let me just share my screen. Can you hear me well, by the way? Yes, okay. Great. So thank you again, everyone, for being here today. Vilna was occupied by the Germans shortly after Operation Barbarossa began, and the first Judenrat was appointed there in early July 1941. After two months, most Judenrat members were murdered in Ponari death sites. Without preceding notice, on Shabbat, September 6, 1941, the Jews of Vilna were given half an hour to take their belongings and move to two ghettos, a big one and a smaller one. The next day, the Nazi commander Franz Moorer appointed Anatole Fried, whom he knew to be the head of the Judenrat. A Jewish police was appointed under the command of Jacob Gens, who was a former officer in the Lithuanian army, a talented, ambitious man with military experience. The headquarters of the Judenrat and the police were in Rudnitska Street number six. You can see the photo here. On July 11, 1942, after inner power struggles, Gans took over the leadership and began and, and became the head of the ghetto. And David Salek Dessler was nominated commander of police. Gans Judenrat initiated in the ghetto the concept of rescue through work. As long as the Jews would work and produce, the Germans would not harm them, so he believed. The members of the Judenrat and the police gained high status. They enjoyed many privileges. First and foremost, work certificates to them and to their families. So they were safe from being deported during violent actions. They also got financial benefits and larger food rations. But the main incentive for people to join the police with it, it ensure their life, or so they believed. The strong will to live, survive, and protect one's family stood above all. Being in the police provided a sense of security, at least for the time being. Additionally, people from lower classes in the ghetto saw an opportunity to climb up in the social status gain power and influence. The deputy chief 
of the police was a charismatic man who was popular and highly respected in the ghetto, Yosef Glasman. He was both in the leadership and a member of the underground headquarter. And so working in the police, he could actually assist the underground in its preparations for resistance. We have other examples from other ghettos where underground members were also involved in the Judenrat. There were more underground members who joined the Vilna ghetto police, both men and women. And let me give you a few examples to show the ambivalence they faced. Chaim Lusky joined the police with the intention to become a mole, a spy for the underground. But he had to keep this, his true intention uh, as a top secret, which caused his own father to stop talking to him out of anger for his son joining the police. Yulek Chalmatz was sent by the underground to work as a policeman in the ghetto gate so he could allow people to smuggle arms into the ghetto. Mira Ginyonska and Mira Bernstein were both policewomen and underground members. Ginyonska informed the underground about upcoming actions and was in charge of delivering intelligence. Both did not survive. When Glasman was offered to join the police, he debated if he should accept the job. He realized the despise he would encounter, but on the other hand, he knew that working from within would enable him to make the police a strong factor that will be able to protect the Jews. He decided to go for it. According to testimonies, the opposite of Glasman was Dessler, who was considered by most ghetto inmates as a rough, exploiter, and collaborator, a man who was loyal to the Germans more than to his own people. His sudden career rise in the police provided him with confidence. He was close to Martin Weiss, the Nazi commander who, according to testimonies, was a regular visitor in Dessler's home. The relationships between Gens and Glasman varied from mutual appreciation and respect to distrust. Glasman was critical about the Judenrat's behavior, especially relating to the Jewish police helping the Germans carry out actions. The decision of Gens and Dessler to have the Jewish police perform the actions themselves and to avoid any involvement of the Germans and Lithuanians in selecting the Jews with an attempt to save the life of ghetto inmates. And here the two approaches clashed, saving most Jews by extraditing a few and preventing panic in the ghetto or regarding this as a crime. A police department, which was corrupted and notorious, according to testimonies, was the ghetto gate security. Their duty was to check the Jews who left and returned the ghetto for work. The opportunities to bribe or smuggle here were huge. The chief of the department was Meir Levas, a hated character in the ghetto who was considered by many as a collaborator. The inmates' attitude toward Gens was ambivalent. On the one hand, people thought he was collaborating with the Germans by following and executing their orders, including delivering people to death. On the other hand, they knew that he was doing everything he could to save Jews, he himself, deeply believed that he had a mission, a calling to rescue as many people as possible. He was obsessed by a kind of mania, believing in his ability to do so. 
It is worth notice that he was married to a non-Jewish Lithuanian woman and had a daughter. Both lived in the Aryan side and he could have easily <clears throat> escaped and saved himself, but he did not. Most underground members looked upon him with much contempt while the general public followed him and supported his policy. In times of crisis, the public needed a powerful leader to follow and to trust. Gens played this role very well. But his illusion was shattered. He was executed by the Gestapo with a pistol shot on September 40, 1943, just 10 days before the ghetto final liquidation. Memorial events were held in his honor in the ghetto. Nissen Resnick, an underground commander, tried to explain this ambivalence toward Gens. Gens had many Christian friends. He could easily stay outside of the ghetto and live in a safe place. His wife begged him to get out. Gens refused. I belong in the ghetto, he used to say. Maybe he was drawn to the role of the commander. Maybe he loved the authority, the uniforms, the ranks, the power, but maybe he referred to his job as a mission and believed that under the existing circumstances, collaborating with the Germans is the lesser of two evils and someone needs to do the dirty job. And he took that responsibility. One of the policemen who was perceived as a brutal man and collaborator was Itzhak Bernstein. We have a first-hand first -hand testimony saying that together with Destler, he had severely beat underground members who did not obey the orders of the Judenrat. However, analyzing that situation, probably those policemen did it out of concern for the greater good. It is hard to judge what was right and what was wrong at that time and place under the abnormal situation. It seems like the Jewish policemen truly believed that they were acting in favor of their, of their people, that they protect them from the extreme German reactions whereas others thought that they were wrong in obeying orders and misjudged the German true intentions. Gens was murdered by the Germans. Dessler escaped the ghetto and hid in a bunker nearby to be later discovered by the Germans and probably executed. We do not have exact knowledge on his death. Interestingly, Bernstein, the policeman, was executed by former Jewish partisans just after the war, after liberation in July 1944, as a revenge for his actions in the ghetto. A unique document was preserved of a protocol of his death sentence, justifying it. However, in late testimonies I encountered People who were involved in his execution express remorse for it. The ambivalence is shown, for example, in a testimony saying that Bernstein saved Jewish family in the ghetto. Another significant case is that of Nathan Ring, the Jewish policeman who was executed by partisans shortly after he arrived in the nearby forest in November 1943. Testimonies show that he actually rescued Jews from actions and others claim that his execution was more political than moral. His story is highly controversial even today and deserves a separate lecture. But perhaps the most controversial event in the Vilna ghetto occurred on mid-July 1943, when the underground commander Itzhak Wittenberg was extradited to the Germans by Gens and Dessler. Underground members freed Wittenberg and hid him in the ghetto. During that night, 
Gantz did everything he could to find Wittenberg and hand him over to the authorities as they demanded. Otherwise, they threatened to liquidate the entire ghetto. In this radical choice between one person destiny versus the entire ghetto fate, Gens was convinced that Wittenberg must go. After a nerve wracking night, Wittenberg surrounded himself. A few testimonies tell that Dessler and Gens gave him cyanide and indeed the next morning Wittenberg was found dead. Since that event, the relations between the underground and Gens deteriorated. But to make things even more complicated, there are testimonies telling that there was a secret agreement between the Judenrat and the underground, according to which the police promise not to touch any of the underground members during actions of taking out ghetto inmates to forced labor camps in Estonia. And in return, the underground would not interfere in this operation. Indeed, during the days of the action, Gens prevented the Germans from entering hideouts of underground members and they were saved. So it is clear that the connections between the underground whose members had been glorified as heroes after the war and the ghetto leadership, which had been perceived as collaborating with the Germans were highly complex and ambivalent. In retrospect, the question still stands if one can conclude whether the Jewish police and the Judenrat assisted or collaborated with the German murder mechanism. The moral dilemmas the leadership had faced were enormous. To quote Ishayahu Trung, who wrote the monumental monograph on the Jewish ghetto's leadership, the Jewish councils had to take fateful decisions on the life and death of people. Although Gens is perceived in some testimonies as one who played God and committed criminal deeds, in most of them is judged favorably. The survivors understand that he was trying to do his best under the impossible circumstances. The ghetto inmates lived on borrowed time, not knowing what the future holds for them. The leaders walked on thin ice, maneuvering between the Germans, the, Germans. the young rebellious underground members and the ghetto public. I would like to conclude with a quote from the real time diary of Zelig Kalmanovich, an intellectual who was called the prophet of the Vilni ghetto. He supported Gens and objected the underground. And he said, we, the ghetto inmates, are not innocent of Jewish blood. We have purchased our lives and our future with the death of tens of thousands. And the forgiving God will forgive us. It is necessary to rescue all that can be rescued. Of course, the noble soul cannot tolerate such deeds. But the protest of the soul has only psychological and not moral value. All are guilty. Or better, perhaps, all are innocent and holy. And above all, the policemen, the Judenrat, those who actually carry it through. They must control themselves, brace themselves, and master the suffering of their souls. They liberated others and chilled them from sorrow. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, I'm going to take over from here. Uh, thank you to all the uh, three speakers. Thank you, uh, Katarina, for, for sharing. Um, and before we get to uh, the questions that start piling up in, in the chat, uh, we have the honor to uh, introduce and have uh, 
Professor Dan Michman uh, speak uh, to us, giving a short response. Uh, Professor Dan Michman is head of the International Institute for Holocaust Research, an incumbent of the John Nachman Chair of Holocaust Studies. He's also a professor emeritus of modern Jewish history and chair of the Arnold and Leonard Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research. Um, and uh, also another title, the incumbent of the Abraham and Edith, Edita Spiegel Family Chair in Holocaust Research, research at bar University. And he's a, among many other topics, he's also an expert on the subject of the Jewish councils. And we're very uh, honored and delighted to, uh, to have him give a short response. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you, Jan, and all the attendants, and uh, good evening. <clears throat> Uh, we heard three very interesting uh, papers uh, about the various places, uh, remote uh, uh, and far distance from each other. And they spread light on what we would call grassroots behavior in extremists by people who belong the, to the persecuted group, yet were driven into the position of executors uh, of the persecutor's goals. Uh, perpetrators go. So they are generally speaking uh, the people that they stay what we call in, in between. And that raises the question, what were they? Traitors, collaborator, collaborators, uh, keepers of the cohesion of their societies? Did they enjoy being in this position? Uh, does the very fact that they were in this position change their behavior also? <clears throat> Uh, these are questions that uh, can be uh, found in Holocaust testimonies and in the historiography from a very early period uh, and were raised also regarding members of Jewish councils, as Jan just uh, uh, mentioned. Um, this, uh, this is what I would uh, later try to understand as uh, questions of leadership versus headship. Leadership growing from in, in within the society and headship that is being imposed on the society from uh, <clears throat> the outside. Although of course these people were part of the society and it is not a clear cut division between them. But if we want to understand uh, the, the basic uh, place where they were standing uh, in this uh, scenario, ah. that's it. Um, now in the wartime and post-war periods, immediate post-war periods, uh, and even later, uh, there was a presentation as if this was a black and white uh, picture. And the majority was good. Uh, there were some villains, and these were the, uh, the Jewish policemen or members of the uh, Jewish councils. And these were attitudes, uh, were part of defense strategies. And that occurred uh, also within a larger context in Europe in the immediate post-war period, right? When in the, the various countries throughout Europe, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the, uh, the governments, uh, the ruling elites tried to uh, reestablish uh, societies and uh, didn't want to go too much into uh, co uh, collaboration issues and so on. So there was a part of, uh, or there was a number of clear collaborators. They were tried uh, and uh, they were thrown out from the positions and so on. But as it was presented, the majority uh, resisted or uh, at least internally resisted the occupation. And that is the basis now for our uh, revival and it, within this larger context, also uh, this Jewish uh, uh, um, uh, picture was depicted by Jews themselves, uh, even more so in Israel, in Israeli society. And uh, so there were the heroes who resisted the Warsaw Ghetto uprising and other ways of uh, armed resistance. <clears throat> and there were these, uh, these villains and therefore also uh, in the DP camps and in various countries, 
uh, and in Israel, uh, capos, uh, policemen, members of Jewish councils were put on trial, or, or at least uh, there were beginnings of pr uh, prosecutions, and there were honor courts in the DP camps, of course, the honor courts, and there is much of uh, literature in, in recent years, in the last decade, has been written quite a lot about <coughs> what happened in, in these courts, and it is interesting for another point that I will uh, point out in, in, a, in a moment. So these early, uh, these early depictions and understandings uh, also penetrated into the historiography. Uh, like the early understandings of Nazi Germany in general, as they were presented in the trials, also entered historiography in the early uh, stages. And uh, during the, the following decades, the later decades, or the end of the 20th century, and especially after 1990, uh, with the opening of many uh, archives of the uh, um, uh, actually uh, finding again uh, open sources like uh, testimonies that were taken in the immediate post-war period, uh, the uh, understanding uh, became much more complicated. And we heard here uh, in these presentations how, uh, how uh, testimonies uh, in the post-war trials uh, can help an understanding uh, the situation uh, in a more precise way. Uh, but if we look at the early presentations, we can see, of course, Philip Friedman, who dealt with it already and at the end of the uh, of the uh, 1940s and the in, in the 1950s, uh, later uh, Israel Gutmann, Aaron Weiss, uh, and Trunk. Um, and later on, in many, many studies on uh, various uh, localities, especially in Poland, but also in uh, other countries like the Netherlands and Salonika, uh, <coughs> for instance. And um, this uh, continued to haunt uh, actually the Jewish communities in those countries. In, in Salonika, this is until today, right? This is an enormous fight. In the Netherlands also, this uh, was ongoing. Films were made and, uh, um, and uh, people were, uh, there, there is a professor uh, at Leiden University who tried some 15 years ago uh, to defend the chairman of the uh, Dutch uh, Jewish Council, David Cohen, uh, in, in an attempt that is not too much con convincing, but uh, you see it, it's still there. Uh, but in generally, you can, we can say that with the benefit of this time, we can look in a different way on these peoples. And uh, uh, Tasha Person has mentioned this uh, in, uh, in the beginning. And, and one of the uh, tools that we use, and we heard it here very, uh, in, uh, in the, the various uh, presentations, and it's very important, the ego documents, right? So looking at the documents, uh, which uh, were created by those functionaries themselves. A year ago at Yad Vashem, we had a, a workshop on the ego documents of Jewish functionaries, right? And that is um, uh, the uh, diaries uh, that they wrote or even documents during the period, then there are uh, memoirs and that and also their testimonies in their trials or when they were interrogated. And uh, what is important here is that uh, we can see the people behind the facade, right? So the facade is what other people saw, uh, that is the, in the Jewish society and in uh, the perpetrator society. And by the way, what I have to say, per in perpetrator society, when I uh, uh, define it in this way, this were, these were not only the Germans. So uh, if we heard about the police, uh, or the Jewish police in the various places. Sometimes they were subordinated to the Jewish council, sometimes directly to the Gestapo, and sometimes to the local police. Uh, so that, that made this uh, different. And it, it is more clear now also that there was no real dichotomy between resistance and coll collaboration. Uh, in many cases, they intertwined. You have, of course, also uh, separate cases of resistance and clear collaboration, 
which I will explain also in a moment, but there are various ways of acting and that is important. And it is important to say that no Jewish functionary identified with the Nazi or Romanian goals, but some indeed benefit, benefited, loved their positions, changed their hearts. They also thought that he could survive by doing so. And uh, Talia brought interesting examples on that. But, but we heard three examples, or let's say two from ghettos and uh, some insights in various ghettos in, in Hungary. But if you think about uh, the fact that there were more than 1,100 ghettos and there were many more Jewish councils, more than 1,200 uh, according to my estimation, right? And they, they were not yet uh, really uh, uh, researched, all of them. Many of them are in the occupied Soviet Union, but as we heard also in Hungary. So we still have to know much more, but altogether uh, uh, it is important to pay attention to one aspect. And that is in much of the discussion until now, and definitely in the, in the immediate post-war period, the emphasis was on the last period, on the last period, the period of deportations, right? In, in Hungary, of course, the situation is different because the uh, ghettos were uh, uh, short-lived and were part of the uh, of the deportation process. But in other countries, this was not so. And uh, the Jewish councils and the uh, order services served throughout a period, right? a period. And therefore, uh, there were real questions of how to maintain reasonably, uh, a reasonably functioning Jewish society under pressure, under perpetration. And uh, there were also, um, uh, uh, people in Jewish society who were not exemplary, exemplary in their behavior, if I can define it in this way. So you have to keep uh, order in a society and especially in a society uh, under pressure. Uh, so the, the behavior of members of the Jewish councils and of the Jewish policemen, although the body in generally, we can find them in many places, but the behavior varied from place to place and it depended on personal characteristics of these people, but also on personal characteristics of the German or Romanian or Hungarian authorities in charge. And that played an important role in the general atmosphere created and the possibilities of behavior of reaction. Um, and, um, I would uh, add another point that uh, via this angle of uh, Jewish councils and uh, Jewish uh, police, we can see a very interesting difference between uh, the Holocaust and many other genocides where these phenomena did not uh, exist because the genocide came in one wave, let's say. And here we have a process which lasted several years and was not uh, the same at uh, every place. Uh, altogether, I'm often asked how I can continue researching the Shah if it isn't depressing. And of course, of course, in a way, of course, yes. But my answer is that the Shah was a kind of laboratory of human behavior, including Jews, uh, as long as Jews are human beings, right? A time of extreme extremes in which human characteristics are presented in their clearest way. These are not always nice characteristics, but they teach us a lot about the possibilities uh, of human behavior. And by the way, not only these cases that we heard today, but there are new studies also regarding other places. There's a very interesting new study by uh, Dr. Lorraine Fastenhout about the three Jewish councils in Western Europe. And this will, book will come out in 2022 by Cambridge uh, University Press. So altogether, uh, we had nice uh, and informing uh, presentations which touched upon these grassroots uh, developments that are now so interesting us as we know uh, the larger picture, but still uh, many aspects of the overall picture inside uh, are still missing. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Michman. Um, for this response uh, that 
generated even more questions. <laughs> uh, and so always running against the time, uh, those events should last five hours to ask all the questions we would uh, like to ask because there's so many uh, uh, thoughts and, and reflections that come up. Um, I think we have time for one round and uh, in order to include every uh, everybody from these uh, wonderful uh, talks and presentations, um, there were several questions that come up in, in uh, that seek more, I would say, variations in terms of gender, in terms of survival, uh, survival strategies. Uh, so I would ask um, each speaker to uh, just respond uh, to the question um, to address maybe the role of gender, the role of survival strategies in terms of tactics, in terms of representation, uh, and maybe in terms of sources, what, what, wherever uh, your, your answer might lead us. And whoever wants to start is, uh, maybe we can, start, we can do the same order of the talks. Hi, uh, okay, so I'll start. Uh, I want to answer Boaz, uh, Dr. Boaz Cohen, um, your question, uh, I want to find out about the motivation of motivations of the uh, Jewish policemen in uh, Tarno. So um, the Jewish police in Tarno uh, formed in October 1941. And in fact, most testimonies contain no um, mention uh, the Jewish police in the period prior the first deportation, which occurred in June 1942. And many survivors, it's very interesting, actually believe that the police um, uh, been for, uh, had been formed only then for the purpose of the deportation. Uh, and you know, it's interesting because on the eve of the uh, deportation, the first action in June 1942, is the Gestapo ordered the Judenrat to start recruiting additional policemen and soon doubling the, uh, the size of the force. Um, and during the time, uh, uh, rumors that uh, some of the towns, uh, uh, during uh, rumors uh, spread that uh, uh, some of the town's Jews would be relo relocated uh, along with the assurance that police recruits and their families uh, would be exempted. So uh, uh, during uh, the, this um, uh, housing during the deportation, a, a, a terrible one, uh, a, before that, uh, with no so many unable to, many people couldn't obtain the life uh, uh, stamp. And uh, with so many unable to obtain the stamp, and many uh, tried to join the, to the police force. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, for instance, uh, one of the uh, you know survivors, uh, the you know the Holocaust, uh, the uh, policeman who survived the war, and uh, William Lerner, for example, and uh, another one, the Harry Weiser, the, the two policemen from Tano, were uh, mentioned uh, during their testimonies uh, that uh, they joined the Jewish police uh, on June uh, 11th. A, a day before the, uh, you know, uh, the same day, I'm sorry, the same day of the uh, Ausiedlung, because they had no other chance uh, to obtain an exemption uh, stamp. So uh, both tried to exploit their personal connection with the Judenrat, the head of the Judenrat, uh, Polkman, uh, and begged him for a job. So uh, it is hard to say that it was volunteer it's volunteering uh, out of free will, you know. Uh, they joined the Jewish police when they realized that it was better to be a policeman than to be deported, you know. And after this, uh, or during this action, uh, the German, the Germans un unassisted by Jewish policemen searched Jewish homes and, you know, they killed them. And uh, 
you know the I think that the, I think that I said that the, the second deportation on September 1942 was a, a turning point in the relation between the Jewish police and the Jews of Tarnow. So, and you know, um, during this time, many people left the Jewish police uh, because, uh, you know, after the, the first deportation, because they uh, uh, realized what, what is going to be. So, um, you know, uh, it's very uh, uh, com complex, uh, complexity issue and, uh, uh, it's, um, I think that you asked me about the sources uh, or we, I think that we all don't have time to tell me if we have time about sources, you know, I have uh, some uh, 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 legal documents about, uh, of people, of people who serve the Jewish police uh, in Tarnow, um, two or three from Poland, uh, as I said before, uh, Zimmerman was sentenced to death. Uh, he, he was hanged uh, in Poland. W William Lerner uh, uh, sentenced to 10 years in prison uh, in Poland too. As I said before, the, uh, mentioned before, the, uh, the it's uh, Simit who emigrated to Canada. Uh, it was really, really a problem for the Jewish, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Jewish uh, uh, you know, communities to deal with and to uh, to know what to do after the war with these people. So it's a very, very difficult uh, issue and uh, complex one. Laszlo, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. So I have seen two questions addressed to me in the in the uh, comment section. Um, the first question was whether there was any legal connection between. We don't Anna. see you. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, you know, home office is a complicated thing. Uh, but, um, so um, you know, the first question was uh, uh, connected to whether there was any kind of legal legal. Uh, connection between unarmed labor service and the Jewish policemen? My short answer is no, because people in unarmed labor service were by and large uh, not deported to uh, uh, the camps. So uh, um, Jewish policemen were deported to the camps and the Jewish police was made up of people who were not on unarmed labor service. The second question was related to uh, um, um, so one sentence being very, very similar in the, in the trial of this Hungarian Jewish policeman. To, to that of a trial in, in Poland, I understand. Uh, it was also interesting for me. I have read uh, recently this book by Don Parad, Bitter Reckoning. Uh, and, and in some of these Kapo trials, I found sentences which were, you know, you just change the names and they have, they, they, they have basically been repeated in Hungarian uh, uh, trials. Some of the things, the accusations, they are very similar. Um, the question was whether there were any honor courts uh, related to the Jewish policemen. There were honor courts in, in Hungary at least three cities, among them Budapest. I've read some of these documents. I have only found honor courts related to uh, uh, Jewish council members and uh, kapos. I haven't found honor courts related to Jewish policemen. So that is, that is my answer. Okay, thank you. And uh, I will go next. Um, so thank you for all your questions. Shmuel Yerushalmi, I will try also maybe to answer yours. I'm sorry we don't have uh, so much time. Um, regarding the, the question of gender, which is excellent question because usually we don't refer to it uh, when dealing with the subject. And um, from my own research on a uh, on the ghettos of uh, Vilna and also some small ghettos in Belarus, we do have examples of uh, women who joined the police or even the Judenrat. Mostly, like I showed today, they were uh, young women. They did not have children or families to take care of, so they could 
devote themselves to the, let's say, to the, um, to the community or to the service. Um, and regarding the motivation, it's also a part of the answer, motivation to, to join the police. I think that in the Vilna ghetto, the, in this example, we, we saw not only the benefits of personal, uh, the, of the personal benefits, but also the motivation to join the leadership in order to assist a, one's group, like the underground, like the resistance or other factors in the ghetto this is very uh, interesting, I think, and very emphasized in the example of Vilna. And I want to thank Professor Michman for his uh, really interesting response. And you, uh, you made a lot of, uh, of great points. For example, the ego documents. Luckily, in Vilna, we have ego documents that um, Gens, Dessler, other policemen, even Nathan Ring and, uh, and other policemen and policewomen that uh, I mentioned, they, they spoke and what they say, said was written and, um, and we can hear their own voice and their own uh, uh, attempts of justification for their actions. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say, I, I saw that uh, some of you mentioned Israel Kastner, the Kastner case, which is uh, very interesting. And um, maybe we should think about, uh, you know, having a presentation about this. Um, and the question is whether the police and the Yudonrat had uh, had a chance to save or to assist in saving and rescuing more people than they did. In the Vilna ghetto, it is clear. I showed you, Gans uh, prevented panic by not telling uh, the majority of the, of the ghetto inmates what's really going on. He took the responsibility, he did the dirty job, but on the other hand, he also didn't really uh, engage all the, the ghetto public in, in the resistance and in uh, escaping or he, he even intentionally, intentionally uh, didn't tell them about uh, what he knew. And this brings us to the Kastner case, if, if you guys know uh, a little bit about it. And so I would like to just maybe conclude this, um, this event by asking yourself if we can challenge the whole concept of uh, leadership, of collaboration, of resistance and rescue. And I think this is what all of us did today. This is what Fetagina Ferson did in her recent book. And uh, we have so much more work to do with other ghettos like Professor Mehman just said. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as tradition requires, I'm gonna uh, give the last words to uh, the head of the program, Dr. Boaz Cohen. Thank you very much again. Uh, we have we had this uh, opportunity to hear so many fascinating researchers, so many three fascinating researchers we had uh, Professor Michman, we had Katarzyna opening very rightly. It's all about choices. Uh, I think uh, the question is, I saw, uh, I think Leonid uh, mentioning in the comments, the term of uh, choiceless choices. Now the question of choices is really, uh, I think at the crux of the matter, because we know that uh, in Israel, by the way, uh, people were, uh, Jewish policemen were charged and couples and others were charged by uh, Israeli law from 1951, two years after the state, it was established three years, you already had a law that enabled, uh, uh, that gave a chance to uh, 
persecute uh, collaborators. Now the question was who was a collaborator? That's a, a very central question. And if we talked about Jewish police, I think there is this story about, I, can't, I don't remember all the details, but it does exist in the research. Uh, this guy who was a, a brought to, uh, to the police by someone who met him a, a, and said he was the, the, an officer in the police in the ghetto and he hit me and he was cruel, etc., etc. And uh, a very enterprising lawyer who was later Israel's uh, uh, Minister of Justice many, many years later, uh, David Libai, wrote uh, in the indictment that he uh, was a part of a criminal organization by being a part of the Jewish police. And they had to rescind the, the indictment because already in the 50s, it was obvious that if a person was in the Jewish police, it doesn't mean that he, that he acted against his people. And I think this is a, a it's very easy to use a fierce words in Israel. You would say, this government is a Udenard government, this government. So we have this, this in Israeli speech, uh, kapos is very common. But uh, I think that what we learn from the story is choices are important. And we hope that we will be in a place to choose the right choices and wherever we have to take choices. But, you, but we can't ignore the choices that people make. And some people made choices to save their fellow people and other people made choices to save themselves by handing in other people. So that's, it's, it's a big question, but there are different choices. And uh, not uh, every choice is uh, commendable, at least morally, I'm not uh, talking in court, I'm talking, uh, what choice would we like to do? Do we like to teach our students to choose a uh, moral choices? This is an educator I'm saying. We want our students to, to be able to make our children to make uh, more choices, the right choice. So we can't just say, oh, well, well, everyone had a choice and that was his choice because, I mean, it's complex. I think we don't get off very easily here, but we did learn that uh, the story is complex. It plays out in a lot of ways in different places. And obviously the work that Azina did on uh, Warsaw and uh, Talia on Tano and uh, uh, what Lasso is doing now, we are in the beginning of a, a maybe a, a paradigm change in the way uh, people are uh, looking at uh, uh, police, maybe at Udinger too, et cetera. So thank you very much. We uh, are really happy for all your contributions. And I can tell you uh, three things. First, we, next month, we will have a networking event exactly a year after we had the one before. Instead of coffee, we thought everyone is going to drink coffee in conferences very soon, but maybe that is not that soon. So uh, somewhere last week of uh, August, after you all be on vacation, we will do a networking event with uh, Natalia Alexun speak, opening by speaking about her experiences in as a researcher in COVID. Uh, so uh, we will start, for, this will be on December, on uh, August, September, we'll talk about photography. We will soon send out a, another call for papers for another conference on the mass murder and war. Uh, another 80 years to Barbarossa conference, uh, because we had a lot of interest in that. And uh, we will do something about uh, Babi Yar and the uh, murders at that, those three, four weeks, and the attack on Moscow, Operation Typhoon. We'll bring the two together, military history and the Holocaust history, and uh, we'll see how that works out. This will do with the call for papers. And uh, the sky is the limit. Hopefully, we're wishing to see you all face to face. If you have any chance of coming to Israel, you are most invited here in the gallery, and uh, we're looking forward to see you. So goodbye and thank you, thank you for the for the organizers, Daniela, Ronnie, Jan, 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for. Bye bye.